Americans are mutually speaking by Navy Mutual. We are dedicated to educating military service members and their families on matters of financial security. The Navy Mutual Aid Association Mutually Speaking podcast is intended for general informational purposes only, as individual situations may vary. Statements made should not be relied upon as recommendations, solicitations, or construed as legal or tax advice. This podcast is not meant to replace the services of a licensed financial planner, insurance counselor, or tax advisor. Programs mentioned and other information referenced in this podcast may change from time to time. If you have questions or comments, or if there is a topic you'd like to learn more about on this podcast, contact us at podcast at NavyMutual.org. This season, we'll be focusing on retirement and long-term financial planning. Today's topics are the military's survivor benefit plan, life insurance, and long-term care. It's a lot to navigate, and it's hard to think about and plan for what you want to happen after you become disabled or pass away, but it's important that you do so. By preparing now, your family will be well cared for after your death or inability to care for them anymore. There isn't one size fits all solution to estate planning and life insurance, but we'll give you the tools you need to make the right decision for you and your family. Here to talk with us is retired Rear Admiral Brian Luther, President and CEO of Navy Mutual. Let's just jump right in and get started uh, with talking about the Survivor Benefit Plan, um, SBP. What is that exactly? Sure. Um, So the Survivor Benefit Plan is a uh, government subsidized benefit. It's a monthly income annuity uh, provided to eligible beneficiaries when a service member passes away. So a military retiree, they receive a monthly pension. Um, but that stops uh, upon their death. And so the survivor benefit plan offers a way to preserve a portion of that monthly income for the identified beneficiaries. And how much money could a beneficiary receive? It it depends. There's a range it's selectable, Um, but it it, uh, starts at $300 and and then it goes up to 55% of your base pay. So when you're on active duty, you're automatically covered, but when you retire, you have to um, actively select um, participation in the survivor benefit program, and um, you have to so you have to say I want to join, and then how much of your pay do you want to um, cover for your beneficiaries, and then um, uh, then a portion of your retirement pay will be used to pay for those benefits. So um, let's say I have SVP coverage at $300. Does it mean that after my passing, my beneficiary would get $165 a month? Is that is that what that math turns out to? Yeah, it <clears throat> depends on what, what um, the selection was. I, I'm a, uh, a simpler man. So if we did $1,000 a month, okay. then you'd get 55% of that, so $550. But remember, it's selectable. Um, of the amount of your retirement pay. So if you wanted to maximize the benefit, it would be 55% of whatever your base pay was. Is there any um, cost of living adjustment worked into this? Yes, that's one of the benefits of Survivor Benefit Plan is that it, it has a COLA associated with it. Is there a cost for participation in SBP? Uh, yes, uh, again, uh, on a sliding scale, but um, if you did 55% of your pay, then the premium would be 6.5% of your veteran retirement pay each month. And that would be until uh, the person dies, the, the, the um, service member passes away? It, uh, it always depends, right? So it, in this case, you know, it depends on when you retired. So um, I, I retired after a longer career, so... Um, uh, Maybe maybe I'll pass before, but if you're a younger retiree, you have to do 30 years of payments okay. and hit the age of 70. So it's a twofold requirement for it to work, right? It. For it to end. So for me, I'll hit 70 before 30 years of payments. So 
So I still have to keep paying um, until I have 30 years uh, of payments. But if you're a younger person and you retired at 41, you have 30 years of payments. Um, but if you retired at 39, right, at, at you won't you won't have hit 70 years after your 30 years of payments. So you would have one more year uh, to go. Got so it. 30 years of, of payments and be at least age 70. Got it. Is there any other reason that uh, premium payments would stop? Well, um, I said before, it's selectable for who your beneficiaries, beneficiaries are. So if it's your spouse or if you have a child, for example, if your child is your beneficiary, the payments stop when the child is no longer eligible to receive the benefit. And that would be 18 years of age unless they're a student, and then that could be as old as 22 or unless they get married. So if you had a disabled child, though, they would be eligible. They may be eligible for life. Um, and then if you give your spouse the benefits and your spouse passed, well, then you would stop making payments at that, at that point. Got it. Um, and then of course, payments would stop once the retiree passes away. Right. Right. Because now you're, now you're actually getting the benefit. Right. Got it. And then how did taxes play into SBP? So a good part about that is your, the premium payments are paid with pre-tax dollars. So that means if you um, if you were going to be paying um, sixty five dollars on that thousand uh, um, dollar that we example that we gave before, right? So your the premium payments reduces your taxable income, right? And it comes directly from your military pension, um, and so it actually reduces the net cost of what you're paying for it. So you you pay right out of your pay with pre tax dollars. Um, that lowers your annual taxable income. Got it. And then how would, um, when you're setting up your beneficiaries for SBP, how would you go about doing that? So when you're retiring, you have to elect survivor benefit plan, and then you designate your beneficiary um, at the time. So if you're going to change it in retirement, there's only a few circumstances um, that you can do that. So you want to know who you're selecting as your beneficiary when you when you select your coverage. Um, and and they make it kind of simple. There's only a few different uh, combinations you can do. So first you do your spouse. And if you select spouse only, it'll be paid only to your spouse. And, and then the payments will stop at their death um, unless your spouse remarries before they turn 55. And so that would be six and a half percent of your base pay to get 55 percent of, of your base pay each month for your spouse's entire life. Right. And as we mentioned earlier, that's a COLA um, cost of living adjusted, which in this high um, inflation time now is truly a value um, to the benefit. Right. Absolutely. Um, second, you could do it with your child. And then, as we mentioned, annuity payments will be to your kid um, until 18 or 22 if they're a student. And then um, <clears throat> this is a little bit more complicated. So they got to figure out your age and the age of your kid. So they have the youngest child. So they figure out um, how long they'll be uh, on the hook for the benefit. And um, but the benefits for or the premiums for the children are a couple bucks a month. They're not that much, right? And then, um, and then the premium for your kids stop when they're no longer eligible to receive the benefits. So my kids are in high school and in college. So as soon as they start graduating from college, um, then they'll start rolling off. And then, uh, the, as we said earlier, the disabled child may be eligible for the duration of their life. Um, and then you could elect uh, that beneficiary via a special needs truck. Seems pretty straightforward. It is not too bad right so and it, it just spouse and children right and then um uh, uh or spouse and children and then so it's either or or it would go to the if you elect spouse and children it'll go first to the spouse and in their absence it'll go to the children um and then the eligibility is just what we discussed before got it 
Um, so in in that case, after after death, your spouse would get your payments upon their death. If the children are still minors or in school, they would get payments until they're no longer eligible. Right. They graduate or age out. Got it. With the covering your spouse and your child, I would assume that that makes it more expensive to cover everyone. Yes, it is a little more expensive, but as I said, it's just a couple of bucks a month. Are there any other beneficiary uh, options besides uh, immediate family? It, it pretty much is limited immediate family. Um, you may be required to cover a formal spouse, um, but that has to be covered as part of um, the divorce decree, right? So um, it is, it's a court order. Um, and then so then the court order makes you cover the former spouse, which does not allow you to cover a current spouse because SBP can't be split. So the cost and benefit would be the same for a former spouse as for a current spouse. So you may be also, you, you, you could also do the former spouse and child um, that we discussed and that they, those would be the same costs as well. And then if it's not written into the divorce decree, uh, can your beneficiary be your current spouse even if you have a former one? Yes. And then uh, I'm, I'm sure you see where my next question's headed, but what if you don't have a spouse or children? Um, in that case, you could elect to make um, the beneficiary um, a natural interest person or someone in which you have an insurable interest. Um, <clears throat> and it just means someone that, that requires uh, um, support on your part, right? Could be a sibling or child who doesn't meet eligibility requirements as written, but there's still a need that, that you're providing support and that person um, would need it should you pass. Um, that option is more expensive than the other options, and it goes up to 10% of your retired pay. Are there any cases in which you can get coverage as a retiree, even if you elected against it when leaving active duty? If you were unmarried or divorced or widowed, at the time of electing SBP, you can get it for a new spouse, but you have to be married for a year um, before it becomes effective. Um, so you can get remarried, but it doesn't trigger automatically. You, you have to notify them. And then <clears throat> after you've been married a year, then, then that, that spouse would be covered. And then um, if you didn't have children at the time of retirement, you can always elect um, to cover children um, after a child is born or adopted. Got it. So while it's limited in who you can choose to be a beneficiary, the SVP does allow for life changes. Exactly. But as long as you signed up for the program, right? Um, right. When you had that eligibility available. And how do you sign up? Uh, well, we've, we've always got a form for everything, right? <laughs> so it's a form, uh, a DD-2656, and then you'll make your elections on that form. You'll sign it and date it, <clears throat> and then you'll have a witness sign and date it as well, um, possibly your spouse, somebody in, in the personal support detachment. But everything must be signed and returned before your retirement date. What are some things that you should consider um, when you're deciding whether or not to elect SBP? Well, you know, we've talked about the importance in the earlier podcast about having a plan, right, and understanding um, your financial situation. So um, all of these these are financial tools, right, to help you achieve the goals in your financial plan. So you should receive your – you should review your assets, your life insurance coverage, right, because – um, maybe SBP is in addition to, maybe SBP is in lieu of, maybe it's in addition to um, the life insurance, your savings, your investments. Um, because in the end, what you're trying to do is to create a plan that will ensure your loved ones have the finance, financial resources that they need to take care of them after you pass, right? So survivor benefit plan is a valuable um, option for that. Um, and it's unique to the military or to, to government service because the civilians have something similar. Um, but unlike life insurance, you don't have to worry about illness or medical history, right? It's the benefit of your retirement. 
So just by retiring, you have it, and you are creating a fixed income for your loved ones for the remainder of their lives. That is inflation adjusted because it has the COLA, the cost of living adjustment associated with it. Sounds like something that everyone should at least consider if they can afford the payments. Um, and then speaking of your mention of, of life insurance, that, that leads me into our, our next topic. So let's dig into life insurance a little bit, um, what it is, how it works, and what's offered to members of the military. Um, sure. So <clears throat> like I said, having life insurance is just another step to protect your loved ones um, should you pass early, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you make your, again, it's, there's, you have to identify a beneficiary. And so you can identify your spouse or your child as the beneficiary, and that will ensure that they have the funds to cover whatever you, you worked out in your plan, you know, the final arrangement, any outstanding debts, a mortgage, cars, um, or fund any other financial goals you have, like paying for college or something like that. So depending on the value of your policy, that could be enough to cover school or mortgage, um, or it could just... Uh, be a lump sum payment that could be used um, to create retirement income for your spouse. So like with any other kind of insurance, an event, in this case, <clears throat> death would happen, and then your beneficiaries would receive a monetary payout at whatever level of coverage you elected. Exactly. Um, and then how much coverage should you get? Well, it, it, like I said, it's all a math problem per your plan, right? So if if you're using it to offset the cost of a funeral or a burial, um, that could be a small $10,000, dollars 20000 uh, policy. Um, if you want to create a legacy and put your grandkids through college, then you're going to want more coverage, maybe um, $400,000, because you got to figure that a state school is about $100,000, 120000 a year now, right? Right. Um, if you want to provide your spouse income for the rest of their life, then you'll have to do some more math, right? And there's calculators online that will help you figure out how much that, that you need. Um, and they'll take into account age, the size of your family, if you have a mortgage or rent, um, what other income needs you'll, you'll have. Um, and, you know, that's all the stuff for daily living, your, your cable and your cell phone right? Who, who won't have a cell phone bill, right? Um, but you have to you figure out all, all those things that you, that you need to pay for going forward and whatever debt you have when you leave. And then what is the required income that they'll need to function without you? Makes sense. So let's talk about the different types of life insurance, because I know nothing in this world is so simple that there's only one. <laughs> you're, you're right. Um, so just like there's a bunch of different problems to solve, right? There's different types of insurance, but at a high level, they really break down into two main categories, um, term and, and permanent insurance. And so term, like it sounds, is, is insurance for a set period of time or a term. And it's there to create a financial safety net for your family um, when you're in your working years, right? And so... This type of policy just generally pays out the benefit, right? There's no cash value accrued or dividends that are coming. Uh, you're saying um, if I if I pass in this 30 years, for example, then I want this much money. So if you have a 30 year mortgage, maybe a um, a 30 year term policy would be something to cover the mortgage. Um, the other, uh, but after that 30 years, the policy ends. And there's no benefit to you because the term expired and your the, the, the contractual agreement has been met by both sides and now you are uninsured. Um, if you don't like that and you want to establish permanent insurance, um, you can do that. And it's also called whole life because it lasts for your whole life, right? Um, and it's there to provide you um, that protection uh, whenever you pass, right? So uh, it has. Um, the same uh, calculation effects, right? What what problem are you trying to solve that will that will determine the size of the policy? Um, but because it's permanent, it also has a savings element associated with it. And I mentioned that so you build up a cash value, so your policy is is, is accruing a value 
um, each and every month that you pay. And you can use that money since that's your money and you can use it as a loan. For example, um, you can make a withdrawal or if you terminate the policy, you can say, I just uh, I want to end the policy. And then they'll give you all that cash or you could say, you know what, <clears throat> um, I think I think I'm pretty good. And then you can say, um, I'd like to stop paying into um, the policy, but whatever uh, life insurance value of, I've accrued up to this date, I'd like to retain that. So you maybe you started out with a four hundred thousand dollar policy. You paid in enough to generate a two hundred thousand dollar whole life policy, and you say, you know what, two hundred thousand dollars is enough, and then I don't want to pay into this anymore. And now you still have um, that life insurance value. If you did that with your term, and you said, hey, um, I'm I'm fifteen years through my thirty year term. And I'd like to stop paying now. And if you just give me $150,000 of term, and they're going to say um, wrong policy, right? And if you quit now, you have nothing, right? Sure. Uh, so. So it makes sense. So so permanent insurance is there no matter what. It's permanent. And then term insurance is for if I only want coverage for a certain amount of time. Right. Yep. It, and then I'm sure it gets a little more complicated from there. It can always get more complicated. Uh, <laughs> so inside a term, <clears throat> there's a uh, there's different types. There's different types of whole life and there's different types of term. So in the military, everybody has term insurance. It's called service members group life insurance. And that's automatically available to service members for the duration of their time on active duty. And it will last after you leave for 120 days after um but for group insurance um you're only eligible for it while you're part of the group so once you leave active duty you're no longer eligible for sgli and sgli goes away so typically people want to replace that so that's where navy mutual come in we have a term policy um but there's also veterans group life insurance and called vgli and that's also available to service members um, but they have to apply within the first 16 months after their separation or retirement from service. Got it. So they're, they're group policies, but they're also term policies because they only provide coverage for selected periods of time. Right. Yep. And we'll go more into SGLI and VGI later. But the other um, type of term I'd like to mention are the same kind of employer-sponsored group life insurance policies. And then what industry often offers, which is called level term insurance. So when you get out of the military, um, you're going to find that most employers offer uh, group life insurance um, as a benefit to their employees and, and often it's free. Um, but the coverage amounts are typically low, not as high as what you would expect to get from SGLI, which is $400,000. And and then SGLI also provides a family SGLI as part of the benefit as well. Um, if you get with your employer coverage, it's probably going to be somewhere like half that or some factor of your of your annual pay, and it won't cover um, your family either, right? That would require a separate policy. And uh, same, same as, as with a group, that coverage will end when your employment ends, regardless of the reason. And... Uh, and your employer doesn't want to give employees permanent coverage, right? Because nobody stays right. at the company forever. Um, right. But while you're there, you're, you're going to be covered. So your term for uh, for that is the duration of your employment. So what do you do if you need to, you know, make up that delta between what you had for SGLI and, and what you're get, getting from um, your group insurance? Um, and that's where level term life insurance comes in. So. The reason why they're called level term is um, they make the premiums the same um, or level throughout the length of the term policy. So you can pick between different terms, um, although the companies that you talk to may have different lengths or different durations. Um, but it's a good planning term tool because a level term means uh, I know for this period of time, I will get this much coverage for this set price and the price won't change for the duration. That's great. So are do are there any scenarios where prices increase on life insurance? Uh, sure. So it, life insurance is an age-based 
health-based product. So the younger you are, typically the healthier you are then. So the younger you are uh, when you purchase your life insurance, um, the lower the price will be. Um, and so when they price premiums, life insurance will consider your age, your health, your habits, right? Like, do you smoke? Do you drink? Um, are you a bad driver? Have you had a, bad, a bunch of accidents? Are you a skydiver, right? Um, your overall health. So they're just trying to figure out how much risk are they taking? Because that's what you're doing with life insurance, right? Is you're, you're transferring risk to someone else. If you wait until you need life insurance, um, you get a bad diagnosis or, or you're getting really old and you say, I guess I need something now, um, you'll face higher premiums because um, you're probably going to have some health issues and you're closer to your time of passing. Um, and that's assuming that if you are insurable, right? Because if, if you had some bad medical event, you could become uninsurable. But uninsurability doesn't necessarily come with age. My youngest son has cystic fibrosis and at birth he was uninsurable. So people can't assume that they're that they are insurable whenever they want, right? Um right. and and we have had times where people have come in and they didn't know there was a medical issue until we did the medical exam and then we asked them, hey, did you know about this? Right? Sure. Um, so sometimes people are surprised, right? Um and that and then that's the most common reason why People are quoted a price and then they end up getting a higher price because they find out they're not as healthy as they represented or, or as they thought. Um, so with term insurance, um, right, so if you've got your term insurance for that block of time, then the coverage ends at that block of time. And now you're older and you're going to have to you're going to say, okay, I want another term because term is typically less expensive than whole life. Um, but people are quite surprised to find out that, you know, in their head, I got a 30 year term at uh, 30 and then now I'm 60. OK, I'd like to get another term. And you're and it is a significantly more expensive proposition to buy a 30 year term when you're 60, because that's pretty much a guaranteed payout at that point. Right. 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 So it's going to be much more expensive uh, if you can even get it to that age. So the earlier you're purchasing life insurance, it sounds like the better. And it, uh, and then it, it also sounds like that that scenario you just described of the sixty year old wanting a thirty year term. That's sounds like you're making the case for permanent insurance. Yeah, uh, not necessarily, um, because permanent insurance guarantees a payout. It's um, it's going to be more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> if if um, if you're looking at your financial plan. And you have to figure out what what are the you know what problems do you need to solve. Um, it, it could come down to uh, um, yes, uh, permanent would be ideal, but if your budget doesn't support it, it would be better to have term insurance so you have the coverage for a period of, of time before you can go in there. Um, Some insurance is better than no insurance. Right. Yeah. Um, and then for permanent insurance, are there different types of that as well? Always. Um, the industry is always there to sell you a solution, right? <laughs> so so you can have whole life, which is kind of what we've been talking about, universal life or variable or variable universal, right? They, they, they can change it all. But at a high level, whole life provides a guaranteed level of death benefit for a fixed premium paid throughout your the policyholder's life, unless you got it in a duration. And you can get duration of payment periods, um, at least at Navy Mutual, right? So you can pay one big lump sum and pay one premium and then have coverage for the rest of your life. You can pay it for 10 years. You can pay it until you're age 65, or you can pay for life. And the longer you pay, the lower the payment will be, sure. right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so whole life is the most basic permanent life insurance product. Um, if you want to get a little bit more engaged with your life insurance, you can do universal life insurance. And here you can have an adjustable death benefit. Um, you can have it level or you can have it increase in. Um, you can have flexible premiums, right? So depending on what you have your policy invested in, based on the interest and investment performance, um, 
uh, it could change the premium. Um, or you could go for variable life insurance, and there as the policyholder, you choose where to invest um, the premiums, and you can get a higher risk uh, investment, right? And, and, you know, for the last 10 years, that's been a very, very good proposition, right? Because people mm-hmm. were making money hand over fist on on their um, their investments. But, you know, the market's gone down 10 20%. All of a sudden, under the um, the the life insurance policy death benefit is based on the underlying assets, right? Well, if your underlying asset goes down 10 or 20%, that's going to have an impact on what your, your life insurance payout is going to be. So in that case, the death benefit depends on market performance. Got it. So whole life guaranteed death benefit amount, universal life death benefit may increase a little because of interest and then variable, the benefit goes up or down depending on the market. That's right. And then how do you know what is the best one for your scenario? Well, so it would all come down to the goals in your financial plan. So if, if you want to protect your loved ones in the event of an untimely death, um, but your budget doesn't support uh, a permanent, then a term policy is going to provide the best protection for you. If you want it to be part of your estate planning, um, then you'd be better off going with a permanent policy. Um, and then from there, it's a numbers game. What can you afford to play and how much coverage do you need? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, So let's go back to term insurance for a minute and talk about, uh, go back to SGLI and VGLI. Okay. So as we said, SGLI is the term insurance provided to active duty for the duration of the service. It it goes up to $400,000 coverage and it's paid uh, through a monthly deduction. So it's, you know, very hands off, right? Um, All service members are covered for the same cost. Um, doesn't matter on your age or your health, um, which makes it kind of unique in the life insurance, but um, that's kind of the group aspect of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and this is different than the $100,000 death gratuity that service members get if they pass, right? Sure. So, um, so a service member going in um, has uh, 400,000 of SGLI and $100,000 uh, death gratuity, um, which puts them uh, average for the term coverage in America. The average American has $485,000 of term. Um, but as I said before, one of the nice things uh, or features associated with SGLI is that also provides coverage for family members under family SGLI. And what's family SGLI? What's that coverage look like? Um, so it'll cover your spouse up to $100,000. And again, this is automatic unless you specifically opt out. Um, the difference between SGLI and family SGLI is um, the family SGLI, the premiums, are determined by your spouse's age, and they increase in five-year increments. So that's more um, of a traditional term policy for renewable term policies, right? Um Children are covered at no cost, uh, and they have uh, $10,000 of life insurance until they turn 18, and then then they age out of the system. That sounds like a pretty good deal. It's a really good deal, especially if someone has a pre-existing condition. So SGLI provides automatic coverage um, as long as you're in the military. But And then, like I said, um, you get 120 days after you leave the military to, to replace it. Um, because it goes away at that point. And then what? Well, you can replace it with private life insurance, um, or you can reach out to the veterans, uh, the VA, and get VGLI. Uh, So let's talk then and dive into VGLI. What's the difference between that and uh, SGLI? So VGLI is more like the family SGLI in that it's a renewable term. And, and same, same, it, it, it does it in five-year increments. And so each renewal then, um, you're five years older. And then as we talked about earlier, the older you are, the more expensive it is, right? So with each renewal comes an increasing premium. Um, the cost also depends on the amount of coverage you select, right? 
Um, and at, at the end of EGLI, or, or the longer you have it, the prices are very competitive in the first couple of five-year blocks, but it gets very, very expensive. Um, at the back end of EGLI, and that's because the benefit of EGLI is that there is no proof of insurability required. So if you can't get insurance anywhere else, uh, and you can elect to have EGLI if you need that insurance covered, you can you can get it. So VGLI, there's no medical exam. Right, <clears throat> as long as you elect coverage within 240 days of leaving the military or retiring. Um, then you, you have it. And remember, like veterans leave the service with all kinds of complications um, from being in the service. Maybe that makes it hard for you to get commercial life insurance at a good price. Um, but VGI, they'll cover everyone. Um, but um, because of that, um, you're getting more people electing the coverage who are, are, are couldn't get it anywhere else. So they're a higher risk. Um, pool, and that means the price increases are going to be pretty steep. Um, uh, so, and then to put it in context, uh, if you were uh, 55 years old and, you, and you're looking at your SGLI, I'm paying $25 a, a month for my SGLI, $400,000. And then I go to VGLI, and now I'll be paying 10 times that at 200 volume. Right. Right. So it's, it's great for people with a significant medical history, but, um, for a lot of people, it, it becomes financially like out of budget. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's guaranteed coverage if you're otherwise uninsurable. Right. So it's great for someone who has significant medical history. Um, so then the last topic I wanted to, to cover today is um, long term care. Mm hmm. That, that's a very important topic. Uh, and it's because people don't normally think about it, um, and I certainly didn't through my entire active duty career. Um, <laughs> but like with life insurance, when you have to think about the prospect of your own passing, people don't like to think about the possibility that they might need help to live. Yeah, I can see why. So what is long-term care? Um, long-term care is any personal care that assists people with what they call activities of daily living. And there's six, but basically eating, bathing, dressing, um, toileting, uh, getting out of bed or not, and being able to go to the bathroom, right? So once you can't take care of yourself um, on a daily basis, then you need long-term care. And then that's gonna be skilled care for, um, Whatever, whatever issue you have or medical condition you have. And it's um, generally provided by licensed medical professionals. And then <clears throat> it could happen at home. It could happen at a, an assisted living facility or in um, a nursing home, right? There's levels of care depending on, on what you need. Um, so long-term care, it's not designed to cure anything, right? It's there just to help you live your life. Um, at the at the lat, latter end of your life, and what might cause someone to need it? <clears throat> it could be anything. Um, we're seeing more young people now. You know those ex sports. You know um, they can get an injury, and and recovery from an injury could result in a requirement for long term care. Um, maybe they got very very sick, had a stroke, um, or they have a chronic physical condition. Um, or, you know, any kind of accident that disables them. Uh, another thing that we're seeing more and more is dementia, right, or right. Co other kinds of cognitive impairment. And so <clears throat> anything that impairs your ability to live by yourself or makes you ne need help on your daily activity counts for long-term care. So I'd imagine that long-term care is expensive. Um, <clears throat> the short answer is yes. Right. Um, uh, the long answer, it depends right uh, on where you live, the, the amount of care you're going to need, the duration of the care. Um, but it's certainly not getting cheaper. And um, and every and there's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. And so the population of those people needing um, long term care, <clears throat> excuse me, is getting larger um, by the day. 
So uh, you have um, not a lot of people going into the field and a lot of people needing the help in the field. Um, so you can get a sense that the costs are rising and, and it's expensive. So a nursing home um, for a semi-private room right now in the United States, the median is 7500 a month. Um, if you want a private room for yourself, um, you can add another thousand dollars on top of that. Um, if you go to an assisted living facility, which is a, a tier below it, um, it's four thousand dollars a month. But you know, whether you're talking about eight thousand or four thousand, I mean, that's fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a year um, just for your long term care. Right. And um, Social Security can range, you know, as low as eight hundred dollars. And I think the top Social Security is like thirty five, um, thirty seven for high interest or high income or wage earners. So if you're an assisted living facility. It could consume your entire Social Security um, for a high income wage earner <clears throat> just for an assisted living facility. Jeez. That's more than what people are paying in their living expenses now and then moving into a fixed income scenario right. where you're, you are you do not have the ability to earn more. Um, right. that's, that's sort of a scary idea. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's something that you should consider and plan for. Right. So um, about 69% of Americans turning 65 this year will need some form of long-term care at some point in their lives, right? So um, it's not something that you need to worry about as you age, it's something that you should be planning for, right? Um, at, because you, to your point, if, if I don't have the ability to make more money, how am I gonna cover these increased costs? And then, like I said earlier, right, 40% of the people who need a long-term care right now are between 18 and 16 because of one of those different reasons that, oh, that we talked about it happening. So um, it is something that you need to plan for. Um, so if the worst does happen, you have a, a resources allocated to it. What are some of the ways that people pay for it? Well, <clears throat> um, you might be able to get some help from your health insurance, but that depends. It varies by the provider. Um, for example, Medicare will only pay for skilled care. Um, Medicaid will pay for nursing care in some cases, but you have to be extremely limited in income and your assets. And before you give away all your money and say, hey, um, I don't have any money, take care of me, they have a look back feature mm -hmm. on that. Um, and then, uh, again, eligibility depends on where you live, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it varies by state and um, the Medicaid and Medicare benefits can change. Um, sure. So even though you say, okay, um, I'll be able to do this or use this, it, that might not be an option um, down the road. Are there options with the VA? So uh, only for those veterans enrolled in the VA system um, will VA long-term care be available. Um, but it's for service-related disabilities, um, and there's a means test on that to certain veterans based on your income eligibility. Um, but the VA won't pay for room and board and live-in facilities, so you still have to cover um, that bill. Um, there are other programs that help veterans stay in their homes, like the household Housebound Aid and Attendance Allowance Program, or there's another one, the Veteran Directed Home and Community Based Services Program. But those are supplemental, they're not core programs. Um, they have eligibility requirements and they have co pays um, that vary on income. So there's always some forms of mean testing. And then what are. Uh what are some other options? Because it sounds like neither of those, Medicare, Medicaid, <clears throat> VA, it sounds like those are all like an add-on. Right, and and they're kind of safety net-ish, right? Sure. Um, they're not there as your primary. So if you when you're working your plan, you have three choices. One, you can plan to pay for the cost yourself um, or ask your family um, for help, right? And then they're gonna, it'll be a cash flow problem for them. 
Um, you could purchase a traditional long-term care insurance policy, um, which are out there, right? Um, uh, but those policies generally require the inability to perform two of those activities of daily living we, we um, mentioned earlier before they provide benefit payments. So <clears throat> if you're having problems with transference and that's your only problem, you're not going to be eligible to use the long-term care um, policy. Um, cognitive impairment, to mention that, that may, depends on your policy. Um, uh, so your third option then is to get um, a combination or a hybrid policy, um, either a life insurance or a long-term care uh, insurance combination um, or an annuity and long-term care combination. Something that creates a fixed income stream um, or a funding stream that will allow you to cover those costs when you need it at the latter stage of life. Got it. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the um, long-term care ins insurance. Okay. So um, again, insurance is just transferring risk to someone else, right? So in this case, you're saying, I'm going to pay a company to transfer the risk of paying for my long-term care. Um, so uh, those who have higher income or assets um, that you don't want to sell, right? Uh, you can, and you and you have the cash flow. You can buy that long-term care insurance, and that will allow you to preserve your assets um, and your financial legacy um, for your estate or your beneficiaries, right? Um, people with a moderate income and assets um, may want to buy insurance since they have the assets to protect. Um, and the long-term care would drain their savings um, if care is needed and they don't have that insurance. So not only does insurance help you protect your assets and preserve your legacy, but it gives you some control over the type and quality of care um, that you receive. Um, and it also, if you have that policy, then you don't have to ask family and friends um, to, to take care of you. you. You maintain a level of self-sufficiency. How does payment for the, that type of insurance policy work? Uh, you make your selections on the, the level of coverage um, that you want. So there's uh, a, a, an amount of coverage. It's a daily rate of coverage. Um, and then the, the, they'll establish a premium. And then you pay that premium in exchange for the guarantee that you're covered should you need long-term care. Um, most long-term care policies um, make you pay the premium um, until you pass or um, you have a qualified claim. And uh, those premiums are generally not fixed and they can increase, like we we're saying, right, with inflation going. So those, those premiums are more than likely going to increase over time. And the other problem is the number of insurers offering traditional long-term care um, it continues to fall in the 90s when the product was first offered. There's like 125 of them. There's maybe 15 long-term care providers today. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, but while you're still associated with active duty, the federal long-term care insurance um, plans are available for active duty military and their spouses. Um, and when you leave the military, you can keep that insurance as long as you continue to pay the premiums. Um, unlike um, SGLI or VGLI, um, the federal long-term care um, and most other long-term cares, in fact, require some form of medical underwriting. And so just because you apply for it doesn't mean you'll get it, right? You have mm -hmm. to be in good health. Um, and so if you are considering it while you are in good health, is a good time to apply for the product. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and then you talked about the the final third option, life insurance. <clears throat> so sure that when I when I said a hybrid policy, so um, some permanent whole life life insurance policies have what they call an accelerated death benefit, um, and that's a feature that will allow you to access um, your death benefit in the event you're unable to perform two activities of daily living. Um, and so it, it sounds a lot like a traditional long-term care policy. Um, it also has a, like a minimum age too. So the, um, I mentioned earlier, the 
forty percent of the people are between eighteen and sixty four but um the whole life policies typically have a minimum age or a minimum time of of maintaining the policy mm. right before you can exercise so you can't just get a policy and go, oh now I need long term care so it's sure. uh <clears throat> a duration of time and an age um, but the main advantage of this is um, your premium payments are fixed, right? You have a guaranteed benefit. Um, if you have long-term care insurance and you never use long-term care, then you pay for that insurance for no gain, right? Um, so you have peace of mind that, hey, it's covered. But if you use a, a hybrid policy like this, um, uh, um, you, you, you're you going to get that death benefit. And if you don't need long-term care, that's fine. Um, but you'll still get your death your death benefit. Um, and you get those fixed rate premiums, so they're not going to go up um, over time like your long-term care policy could. Yeah, that sounds like a great feature to add to a policy. It makes sense. Um, that way, you know, like <clears throat> you said, uh, with long-term care traditional policy, it's sort of like uh, with your car insurance, right? You, If you never right. get into a car accident, you never... Use right, but you, always, but you always want to have that car insurance right. just in case, right? So, right. and then, you know, you can add it to your life insurance policy. So you can, you can get a long-term or you can get a life insurance policy and then add an annuity to that. And so now you've got two fixed income streams. You've got the death benefit that's helping you on one side, and then you take some of your investments and you get an annuity stream. And then, so now you, you have... Um, in your cash flow planning, right, you can you have these fixed incomes that are going to allow you to cover those costs. Who who would you suggest plan for uh, long term care? Um, <clears throat> everyone who plans on getting old, uh, <laughs> because yeah. um, medical. I mean, you know, it's a first world problem. But I mean, let's be realistic. The medical system here in America is doing great business for people, right? People are getting older and older and older. And, um, you know, I, you know, I don't know about your family, but <clears throat> my, my dad's, um, my great aunt lived to a hundred, 105 actually. Right. My parents are in their eighties and they're going strong. And so the medical care that we received is better than the medical care that our parents received. So mm -hmm. the things that, um, people pass from before medicine is handling. And so people are dying now when their bodies are wearing out, not from sure. tuberculosis or from a form of cancer. Right. So anyone who plans on getting old should, should realize that they have a chance of getting really old. And so you really should have a plan in place for the possibility of of needing long-term care. So do your research now, plan on it before you need long-term care. So you can select a policy or a combination of all the different things that I mentioned earlier that will give you coverage for the needs that you have. It gives you the control over the care that, that you want, right? Um, and you can have it before dementia strikes, right? So that your state knows how you want it to be taken care of. Because I don't know anyone that is sitting here realistically, that's a joke, but nobody's sitting here saying, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm just going to make my kids take care of me. Nobody's that that's not, you know, the real plan, right? People are sitting here saying, this is how I'm going to take care of me. And, and so whatever they do now, future you will be um, very happy and appreciative of. Yeah, right. And it's it's just also another like risk mitigation for, you know, you all you spend all your working life saving for retirement and saving all this money up and working your investments. And then if, you know, tragedy strikes and you've you're not deceased, but you're, you're still incapacitated, you've still got right. to keep spending money. Um, how do you protect your finances? Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, so any, any final words today? Well, <clears throat> to, to continue on with that theme, I'd say it's never too early, right, uh, to start planning for the future. I think it's uh, an, an African proverb, right, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Uh, the second best time is today, right? So um, start planning now. Um, yes, you'll have to think about some unpleasant topics, right? Nobody sits there and says, 
and to your point, right? Oh, I worked my whole life to retire into long-term care, right? Uh, nobody wants to have that as an unpleasant topic. But <clears throat> if you even just consider it, it allows you to make some decisions now <clears throat> that will protect your finances and your family in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So buy, buy one life insurance policy and let it do double duty. Let it do triple duty, right? Let it be a long-term care uh, factor or contributor. Let it be an estate planning tool. Let it cover your mortgage, right? Um, think about how you would finance your long-term care if you needed to do it. Um, figure out who your beneficiaries are going to be. Um, think about survivor benefit plan um, if you're approaching retirement, right? How are you going to take care of the ones you love, you know? And once you start making decisions, then that that narrows all the ambiguity out of your future, right? So if you can sit there and say, okay, I am providing my spouse 55% of my income that's pull uh, protected, well then your spouse has peace of mind too, right? That's in in the end, that's what that's what money is supposed to do. It's it's supposed to give you peace of mind um, so that you can relax in the future. Great. Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Happy to talk. Your future is in your hands. You don't know what's going to happen, but you can plan for the worst and hope for the best. Protecting your finances and your loved ones along the way. Needing long-term care isn't an inevitability, but planning for the possibility will set you up for success should you need it in the future. Death, unfortunately, is inevitable, and taking the steps now to provide for your family in the future with the survivor benefit plan or with a life insurance policy will prevent strain in the future. If you need help, financial planners are great resources. Active duty service members have access to free financial planning through the DOD Office of Financial Readiness. Civilians don't have many, if any, free options outside of the internet, so take advantage while you're still in the service. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Rear Admiral Brian Luther. Join us for our next episode when we will be discussing estate planning. Visit info.navymutual.org slash mutually speaking to access resources and information related to this episode or submit a question to podcast at navymutual.org.